let's take a look at how to add vectors using vector components today. So a little warm-up exercise for you. We've got a person that walks this path here. What I'd like you to do is to tell me how far east did they end up going and how far north did they end up going. So pause the video now, try that for yourself, come back to the answer. So what you probably did was said, okay, well, they went five units to the east and then they went back by two units, so that would be three units east, and then they went another ten units east, so three plus ten, that's thirteen units. So they must have gone thirteen units east. And then you probably did the same thing with the north-south stuff. You could treat the north-south, the vertical stuff, completely independent of the east-west stuff, the horizontal stuff. And so you probably said, oh well, eight units north minus four units to the south gives you a grand total of four units to the north. If you are able to do that exercise, you're going to have no trouble at all adding vectors using components because that's the exact process that we're going to use. A quick but very important question for you. Do vectors have a position? That is, would this vector here be the same vector if it was on the moon? Well, hopefully you said, of course it would be. Vectors aren't different vectors just because they're in a different position. They're totally defined by their orientation and their length. But what that means is that you can move vectors around and you're not changing the vector. So I can take these two vectors here and move them around. And if I move them around such that the head of one vector joins the tail of the other, then I'm doing what's called adding the vectors. So this side of A is the head of A because the arrow is pointing towards this end of the vector. This end of the vector here, it's the tail because the arrow is pointing away from the tail. And this vector here that goes from that very first tail to that very last head, that would be called the resultant or the vector sum. And it's obvious that this is going to be useful because let's imagine somebody walking on a field, say, and they do this displacement here. And then after that, they do this displacement here. What would be their displacement from their starting point? Well, it would be this resultant right here. So what does it mean to add vectors? It simply means join the vectors head to tail. The vector sum or resultant will go from the first tail to the last head, from here to here. Something you might be asking yourself now is, do we get different resultants if we add the vectors in different orders? Well, let's check that out now. We've got three vectors, a red, a green, and a blue one. So I'm going to add them blue followed by red followed by green. If I do that, my resultant will go from that first tail to that last head, like so. Now, let's change the order up a bit. Let's say, start with red, go with green, and then blue. Let's see if we got the same resultant. Look at that, same resultant. So it doesn't matter at all what order you add the vectors. You still get the same resultant. In fact, here's a little animation from the Classroom Physics site. They're adding five vectors, but you can see here the resultant that green R vector is the same no matter what order those five vectors are added in. This idea that vectors can be added in any order and they'll still give the same resultant leads to what's called the parallelogram method for adding two vectors. So let's say we've got two vectors. Let's say we've got this green vector and we've got a red vector and we want to add them up. Now, we could do green first, then red, or we could do red, then green. But, of course, in either case, you have to get the same resultant. And that means that we're going to get this parallelogram right here. Now, even though it's a little more work creating the parallelogram rather than just one side of the parallelogram, there are a few advantages to using the parallelogram. For instance, usually when you begin a free body diagram, you start with forces at some central point. That means tails 
in the forces of a free body diagram start out being joined. So then all you have to do to add the vectors is complete your parallelogram. Secondly, it tends to be just a little easier and more accurate to draw the parallelogram simply because you're adding it twice and you've got to end up with the same result. So that makes it a little more accurate. And then thirdly, turns out that the other diagonal, this one here, is going to represent the magnitude of the subtraction of the vectors. And which direction it goes will depend on whether you're subtracting the red one from the green one or the green one from the red one. I'll be making another video on vector subtraction, so you might want to watch that video. Now you might be asking yourself, what's the use of having two different forms of vector, polar form and Cartesian component form? What's the point of that? Well, the good thing about polar form is it's just a little more intuitive. It tends to be a little more natural to say, oh well, our displacement is in that direction and it's that far. And so typically, when you're solving problems, the vectors are originally given in that polar, more intuitive form. And now, what's so great about this Cartesian component form? Well, let's say I want to add two vectors. There's my first vector. There's my second vector. I join them head to tail. Now, if I represent those vectors in component form, the components would look like so. First vector is x component. First vector is y component. Second vector is x component. Second vector is y component. Now, if I kind of get rid of my original vectors, then I'm back to that warm-up exercise. And it was so easy in that warm-up exercise to figure out what the resultant displacement would be. If we call this x component x1 and this compo x component x2, and then my resultant x component would simply be x1 plus x2. Then I treat the north-south or vertical stuff separately. And I'd get a y resultant. And it's simply going to equal this y1 plus this y2. And of course the y2 would be a negative number. So my resultant in component form, that xr, yr, is simply going to be equal to x1 plus x2 and y1 plus y2. So if you know how to add, including how to add negative numbers, then you're going to have total success in adding vectors. Is vector addition important in physics? Well, I'd argue that it's the most important mathematical technique in all of physics. You've learned about Newton's laws, and you did free body diagrams. And what was really important to the motion of the object was the net force. Well, a net force is really a vector addition of those forces. That net force is really the resultant force. It's a vector addition. The tension plus the normal force plus the weight plus the friction as vectors. When you study relative motion, you might have a current, a velocity vector going this way, and then you try to swim across the river. And so you'd have a natural swimming speed. You would add up those two velocities, that of the current and the natural swimming speed, and you get a resultant speed, which would be your speed relative to the shoreline. And remember, definition for velocity is the change in position per unit time or the displacement per unit time. Here you're subtracting vectors, but vector subtraction is really adding the opposite vector. So that's really vector addition as well. And acceleration, remember, it was the change in velocity. Well, those are vectors again. Subtracting vectors is really adding the opposite vectors. So in the short amount of physics that you've studied already, vectors have been very important. And they become more and more important as you move on. So here's a typical word problem where you're asked to add displacement vectors. Now often in the problems you'll be given different ways of expressing your orientation. This particular notation simply means, okay, start with the direction east, work your way 25 degrees towards the north, and that will be your orientation. Of course this is just a polar angle of 25 degrees. So the steps that we take in these problems, we always start by getting into polar form. So if we have some strange convention for expressing the orientation, we need to convert into regular polar form. Step two, we convert to component form. So in the last video, we learned how to convert back and forth between polar and component form. We're just going to use that skill here.
Once we've got it into component form, then it's really easy to add the vectors in that component form. Step four, we're going to convert back to polar form, the more intuitive form, and then as a final step, we want to express our answer in whatever form the vectors were originally given. So in this case here, we want answers like 250 kilometers, north 30 west, that type of thing. So let's go back and solve the problem. So I've drawn the two vectors. This one is east 25 degrees north. It, and this other vector with a length of 280 kilometers, for that one you start at south and work 13 degrees towards the west. So I've drawn the two vectors. What I want to do now is to write them in polar form. So I'll have an r1 and a theta1, simply equal to the length, 250, and the angle, polar angle, 25 degrees. And then there'll be an r2, theta2, which will be the length of that vector, 280 kilometers. And the polar angle theta here is going to have to be equal to 270 minus 13 degrees, or 257 degrees. So this will be 257 degrees as a polar angle. Second step, convert to component form. So remember, component form, x will be equal to r cos theta, and y will be equal to r sine theta. Do that for both vectors, so we'll get an x1 and a y1. x1 will be 250 times the cosine of 25 degrees, and then 250 times the sine of 25 degrees for the y component. Plug those into your calculator, you should get 227 and 106. And then we do exactly the same thing for x2 y2, that is for this vector here, so we get 280 times the cosine of 257 degrees, followed by 280 times the sine of 257 degrees. Plug that into your calculator and you should get negative 63 and negative 273. So you notice the, both those components are negative, and that agrees with the direction that this is pointing. It's pointing into the third quadrant, where both x and y are negative. So here's my two vectors in component form. Remember, it's super easy to add once you're in component form. Our resultant x component and resultant y component will simply equal the sum of the x component. That is, we move 227 units east, then we move back by 63 units west. And in the north-south direction, we move 106 kilometers north, and then we move back south by 273 kilometers. Do the math, and you should get an answer of 164, followed by negative 167. So let me do a brief sketch of that. We had a first vector at length 250 at 25 degrees, second vector was at 257 degrees and just a little bit longer at 280. So then we added those two vectors, 1 and 2. The resultant would be this vector here. So there's our resultant vector. And what we're saying now is that the components of that resultant vector, that is the y component and the x component, will have values of 164 for the x component and negative 167 heading south for the y component. So what we'd now like to do is convert back to polar form. So we want to work out that resultant vector in polar form. The length of my resultant vector will be equal to the square root of 164 squared plus negative 167 all squared. I don't really need to put in the negative sign because it's going to be squared anyways. If I work that out, I should get 234 kilometers. In other words, the length of that vector is 234. To get the angle, it's going to be the inverse tan of y over x. That would be negative 167 divided by positive 164. And notice here that x is greater than 0. So you don't need to add 180 degrees to your result. Plug that into your calculator and you should get an answer of negative 46 degrees. In other words, in other words, this angle here, 
coming down to our resultant vector is going to be 46 degrees. And because it's clockwise, that would be negative 46 degrees. So the last step is to express your answer in the same form as given in the question. So we know the resultant displacement is 234 kilometers. We just need to express it in that sort of standard format. So if we were to start at the direction of east and move 46 degrees towards south, there's east, there's south, so we want to move through 46 degrees here. That would be our final solution. And that's all for today, folks. Thank you very much.